Hello and welcome. Today I am going to show you how to flatten a piece of the cortex of a 2D very high resolution image. And this image will be a histology image instead of an MRI image. So the reason why I'm doing this is because Michael Arcaro asked me a few questions about how to best use Laney to flatten a piece of the cortex that he imaged. A cortex of a macaque monkey brain. And uh, he was having some difficulties and I just had a look at his data and uh, come up with some suggestions for him to do, especially using the new Laney programs. So Michael is the head of the Arcaro lab and they do lots of visual neuroscience and lots of cool stuff. And I saw that they were actually looking for a postdoc. So if anyone sees video is, is interested, maybe you can go ahead and try to apply. Anyway, uh, other than this, so in, in this part of the screen, you can see that I have a plan of attack to how to flatten a piece of the visual cortex of this macaque monkey data. And you can check the steps that I'm going to show in this video. Okay, first thing to do is to have a look at the data. So I have loaded the data in ITK Snap. This is a 2D image. I believe the resolution is around 50 micron. And this is a staining image. So this is not MRI data. It's only a 2D photograph of a like a fixated and cut out slice of the macaque monkey brain. And Michael told me that this area is the visual cortex. Don't mind the headers because I think it, they are not completely correct, like nifty headers in terms of resolution and the positioning information, but we actually don't care about that right now. And what Michael wants to do is to get this piece of the cortex that is V1, I believe, and straighten it to have a look at the layering patterns and maybe a few other things. Of course, he has many other slices and he wants to just see how to do it in the right way in a single slice, and then he can go ahead and maybe do the other slices. Okay, so what I have at hand is an ROI mask that I get from Michael and it looks like this. So this just denotes the V1 area. Fine. And I have a segmentation file. So you can see that in this segmentation file, all the gray matter is labeled. All the white matter is labeled and everything else is labeled as like some other label. This is fine. And we can actually go ahead and use our tools with this. However, I would like to show you uh, an important or it, it might become important in the future trick in Laney. By reducing this red, these red and green areas into just their borders, we can speed up our Laney programs considerably. Okay, so first thing to do, I'm going to borderize this stream file. And to do that, I'm going to use LN2 borderize. That's a kind of a new program actually in Laney. So let's call LN2 borderize. And you can see the details that is written in its help menu. Now let's use it. And let's have a look at this option, which says jumps. And it says one gives thinnest borders and three gives thickest borders. So I'm not going to explain in detail, but basically this is how it uh, figures out if something is a border or not. And let's get a bit of a thick borders because they are like easy to see in the video. Okay, let's run it and see the result. Okay, let's load it. And now hopefully you can see that all these filled in areas just turned into their borders. And this can be useful in some other context too. But now I'm going to use it to speed up the Laney programs. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is that actually we want to keep the blue as filled in because they denote all the gray matter voxels while reducing the red and green only to their borders. To do that, I'm going to use a very cool small program called NEMATH. Here you can see that it's uh, by Chris Rordon and a few other people. And this program I found recently and I find it very cool because it's basically FSL maths, but a few enhancements, very meaningful enhancements. And it is very easy to install around like in different computers. You don't need to download the whole FSL package and maybe many other things that you don't need to use actually. 
So I find it very cool. So I'm like using it. And but if you have FSL installed in your computer, probably you already have the equivalent, which is FSL mods. Okay, let's go ahead. So now I have separated the label tree from my initial segmentation. You can see that this is just blue now. And I have separated label 1 and 2 from my borderized file. You can see. And now I'm going to combine them. As you can see now, it is only blue and the borders of red and green for the inner gray matter border and outer gray matter border. Uh, you, you might see some maybe segmentation like errors. It could be done better, maybe tweaked a bit. Yeah, but I'm not really focusing on that part now. It's good enough for the purposes of this video. Okay, now let's go ahead. And now I'm going to compute layers. But I'm going to add an extra flag, which is called equi volume. And this is a very important part of computing cortical layers or cortical depths in high resolution data. Because the neurobiological layers follow this equi volume principle. If you want to read a bit more about that, I would like to suggest the following papers. So first paper I would suggest is the is is this one from Weinert et al. Last author Pilu Bazan. And here you can see that in Figure One this is a sketch from 1929 from a Dutch neuroanatomist called uh, Siegfried Thomas Bock, and he was the one who proposed this equivolume principle. And the other paper that I would like to recommend you to read more about equivolume principle is this recent one from Jack Consolini and last author Maria Holland, which I find very cool because they translate Bog's old papers written in German to English and also put it into a more modern context. So you can have a look at this one too. And there are some really cool figures here explaining why we need to understand and use the equivolume principle to compute the cortical layers. And the last suggestion that I would like to have for you to read more about the equivolume layers is actually the, the book written by Siegfried Thomas Bock himself. And the book is called The Histonomy of the Cerebral Cortex. I do have a copy of it myself, actually. <laughs> and actually, this copy is a version that we have scanned together with Sven Hildebrand, another PhD student, a few years ago, after I got the uh, second-hand copy of the book. And in this book, you can see how Siegfried Thomas Bock translated and talked about his own work himself, about the equivolume principle and why it matters. So it is a fascinating read, also a fascinating title called Histonomy, and not Histology, interestingly. But that's a story for another day. Okay, now let's go back to our data and let's compute it. The program is done. It gave us some new files. You can see that some of them are called Equidist. Some of them are called Equivol. Equidist is for equidistance and Equivol is for equivolume measurements. Okay, now first load the equidistant measurement. Oh, nice. Everything looks nice. It computed three layers because we didn't give it uh, how many layers we want. We could have increased it, of course. And now let's see how the equivolume looks. Oh, uh, equivolume looks a bit strange. You might think that maybe there's a problem. Of course, you would be right. There is a problem. And the problem is that the default parameters that we selected for the Laney programs are optimized for 200 micron isotropic resolution MRI data. But this image has a much higher resolution, around 50 micron for the voxels. So what should we do? What we should do is to go and change some of the parameters so that the equivolume map will look correct. And the parameter that I'm talking about here 
is this one called iter smooth standing for the number of smoothing iterations and now this value is set to 100 but i need to increase it quite a bit because this data set has so much resolution so let's do that and see the results and here i'm going to use quite a bit more 5000 and let's run it and wait and see So one important note is that you see that it says smoothing equivolume transitions and this smoothing parameter and how to set it is actually uh, like unknown. We, we do not know it, how to exactly set it. This is a bit of a standard question. I set it using some like intuition over processing many data sets and if it looks correct or not after computing it but actually it's a discussion in itself computation is done let's have a look at the results for that i'm going to load the new equivolume segmentation and here you can see that now it looks much better no more of these strange jumps in, in between regions and now let's compare it to the equidistant layers. So you can see that things are a little bit different. Okay, now this layers file is just for quick visualization and actually I do not like to use them too much. Instead I use these metric files that are written in floating point precision for each voxel. What is the normalized cortical depth measurement there is and the normalization can be done either with equidistant or equivolume principle just for you to see i can load it as an additional image and you can see that this is now a smooth field that is not arbitrarily binarized okay now next thing to do is let's have a look at this middle gray matter files so this is the middle gray matter file computed from the equidistant measurement and this is the mid gray matter file computed by the equivolume measurement. And here you can see the difference. Okay, for the rest of the video, I'm going to use the equivolume measurements. And the next thing to do is to mask for my region of interest. And for that, I'm going to use NEMath again. As a result, I get this following file, which only has the middle gray matter denoted in, the, in our region of interest. I'm going to show you two advanced steps and two new programs in Laney. Okay, what are these steps about? We can consider the equivolume cortical depth measurements as our first parametrization. But the second thing to do is actually to straighten this piece of cortex. We need to parameterize the cortex along the middle gray matter line or, or tangentially with regards to the cortex. Okay, let's do that now. I'm going to start from this file. And then I'm going to go to one end of it, for instance, here. Then I'm going to label a single voxel. To do that, I'm going to unload the segmentation. And then at the voxel that I have here using ITK snap, I'm going to put a single label and I'm going to save this. Okay, here we have it. Next thing to do is to use LN2 geo distance program. And this program basically computes the distances within a region starting from whatever voxel is labeled. In, in, in the input. Okay, now let's see. I mean, the details are kind of written in the program anyway. You give it an initial voxel that denotes the zero distance, and this is the our initial point that we have labeled here. And then we give it a domain. And the domain is the masked equivolume middle gray matter voxels. And we can call the output masked distances. Oh, I forgot to put the output. Well, it's computed, it's pretty fast. And let's see what that file contains. You can see that that file contains 
the distances that is computed starting from that small voxel. And uh, if I change the mapping, you can see that our initial voxel is here and the distances are low there, zero, and it increased towards the other end. So this is our tangential cortex parameterization. But now we are not done yet because this is just a middle gray matter. We need to extend it to the rest of the cortex. To do that, we are going to use another program called LN2 Voronoi. I also refer to this step as propagation or extending, and things like that. So let's use it. I'm going to give my mask because that denotes the, all the cortex that I'm interested in. And I'm going to initialize it with our computed middle gray matter distances file. And I'm going to call the result propagated. Okay, it's done. Now let's see how this file looks like. And here you can see that it took all the initial distances and propagated to the rest of the cortex. However, now there's a detail. For instance, here. This looks like a big jump. Well, it is correct because we didn't use any smoothing in this propagation. And of course, the voxel that has the initial information is just like copy, like got copied its value towards the rest of the cortex. And like these tears can occur. But basically what you need to do is to smooth it a bit. And here I'm going to use just 100. I, I'm not sure. Like I, I just felt like it. Now let's have a look at the image again. And see, with a bit of smoothing, those tears are now gone. Okay, this is all fine. So now, what is important here is that we have the radial parameterization of our region, but also tangential parameterization. So this is all we need to flatten it. And to do that, we are going to use the new Laney program that I actually written for Michael Arcaro's case, which is this case. But this will be a very useful program in the future anyway for processing 2D images. And it's called LN2 Patch Flatten that works for 3D images. But now we are going to say 2D. This is the two dimensional equivalent of it. Okay, so for the values, you can read the details, of course, in the help menu. For the values, I'm going to put the initial file, the anatomy, because we want to straighten that one or flatten it. Then we have the tangential coordinates. And the tangential coordinates was the one that we have propagated right now. And for the radial coordinates, I'm going to give the metric equivalent file. The other thing to do is to give a domain. That is our masked region. And we need to determine the resolution of our output file. So radial beans, let's give like 10 for now, just to try. And the tangential beans, let's give 100 maybe. Or yeah, let's give like 40. Okay, let's compute it. It has computed something and let's have a look at that. Oh, look. <laughs> This is the piece of cortex that we had and we just flattened it. However, it looks a bit weird. It looks very voxelated, right? The reason for this is that we selected a quite a small final output. What happens if we increase it? Let's say 1000 and let's say 4000. So this is much larger. Let's load it. Oh. Okay, we loaded it, we see things, we see voxels, but we see lots of empty space too. Well, this happens because our end, uh, and this is a very important stage that is programmed like this on purpose by default. So each voxel in our initial space, that is the folded brain, ends up at exactly at a single voxel in the flattened version. And if our flattened version has a much higher resolution, 
than the initial folded brain. Of course, we will have some empty spots, like we, we never measured data there. And of course, we can do something about it. We can make up the data in between and we can use lots of different interpolation methods to do that. There is one that we have implemented in Laney, which is a very straightforward one, and it's called Voronoi. And you can think of it as a nearest neighbor interpolation, basically. So let's see how this will result. Okay, whoa, see. <laughs> this is our V1 cortex. You might see that there are some maybe artifacts around the edges when the cortex is bending a lot. I am actually right now not sure why it, where it come from. But for the most of the region, we have straightened it or flattened it quite well. You can see all these small details. So now the task is accomplished. This is what Michael wanted. And this is a way of doing it. I am sure that there are many other programs there too. However, now at the end of the video, I would like to show you the difference between the equivolume cortical depth measurements and the equidistant cortical depth measurements because I am hearing time to time some researchers question if this equivolume principle is useful at all. To me, there is no doubt that is useful and here, are, here I'm going to show you why. So now let's rename our current output. Remember that it was equivolume. And now let's rerun our program again, but changing the radial coordinate from equivolume to equidistant measurement that comes from LN2 layers. Okay, here it is. Let's rename it right now and let's load these ones. Okay, here is the equidistant flattened image. And here is the equivolume flattened image. You can see that especially around the around the areas where the cortical curvature is changing, which was not too much in this 2D image, but there can be other areas. You can see that the equivolume one gives us a much more straight laminar profile, although not perfect. And those areas where it is still bending maybe quite a bit, these might be due to the segmentation biases that we have. And this might be reduced by polishing more the segmentation in those areas. Whereas if you look at the equidistant measurement, yeah, it is just uh, really bent. So if you were to assume your middle gray matter to be here, let's say, it will show very different uh, intensity variations. Whereas if you were to plot your layer, let's say you want to capture this dark stripe between like whatever, like 70% to 80% or something, it, there will be much less variance. And this is the important, which means that by implementing this equivolume principle in our algorithm, and of course, there might be questions about how well it is implemented and if it is optimized. And these are some other advanced topics that I'm not going to discuss right now. But the point is that equivolume principle really does matter when you have high resolution data. And the other aspect that I would like to highlight here is that we are trying to compute the equivolume layers of a 3D neurobiological structure, the cortex, but using a 2D representation of it. We only have a 2D single slice here. And of course, just by that fact, when the curvature is changing a lot and if the slicing direction is not well aligned with regards to the cortex, we will have some biases in our equivolume esti estimation. We cannot avoid it because we are trying to estimate something that is truly in 3D, but using 2D information. And these are the challenges and there might be solutions for those two, but these are like right now very advanced topics that I'm not going to go about. But that's it for today. Thanks for listening and have a nice day.